I'm going to present our next and final keynote speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Juan Pablo Bocajero, who is a professor of transportation at the University of Los Angeles, Los Angeles in Bogota. And he does research uh, in very uh, different fields, which include transport economics, land use and transportation, which is also our topic in, in our conference, accessibility and road safety. He developed several studies on the impact of metro, cable car, and BRT systems, uh, and its impact on density, land use, accessibility, and value capture schemes. And he has also been a policymaker for the last four years, has been the Secretary of Mobility in Bogota. And during his tenure, Bogota started the construction of the first metro line, increased the use of bicycle by 40%. Which reached 1. million trips a day and reduced road fatalities in 15%. And besides that, it also uh, has implemented one of the largest low emissions buzz uh, in Latin America. So I'm not going to take any more time for you all. So please, Dr. Juan Bocarejo, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Joao. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone at Portland for inviting me to this session. I'm very honored to, to be here. I'm very sorry to, to be late. I had a connectivity problem with the internet. I hope you can hear me okay. I don't know if the, the connection is okay. If you can confirm that, Joao, can you hear me properly? I can hear you properly, and I'm also having some connectivity issues. So I guess that everyone else is hearing you perfectly. Great. Thank you. So uh, what I wanted to discuss with you uh, and, and to show is the experience in Latin America. I've been working uh, for almost 30 years in Latin American projects in transportation and in urban projects. And I think uh, our region is fascinating. Uh, I know that most of, us of uh, Wessler uh, attendants are probably from the United States and from Europe, and they probably are not so familiar with the, the specific, specificities of uh, Latin American cities. And that's what I wanted to show. I have the idea that some changes uh, related to the interaction between transportation and the city may happen quicker in Latin American cities. The, our cities are less consolidated. Uh, they have been growing very quick. And I think that this, we could say that this is like a laboratory of theories. So we've been, we've been working with a lot of uh, theoretical analysis and trying to see how this uh, uh, theory applies to the specifics of our cities in Latin America. Uh, as Joao was saying, uh, I am a professor at Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, uh, but I've, I've also had the chance to be a consultant for many years uh, with different uh, international uh, institutions such as the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. And so I had the chance to visit many cities in Latin America. And that's the experience I, I want to, to share with you. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Sorry.
Good. So first I want you to, to show, I want to show you some characteristics of Latin American cities. Uh, I will work specifically uh, with capital cities, with the, the, the biggest cities in Latin America. Of course, every we, we have different kind of cities, different uh, categories, especially uh, related to the size of, of the city. Uh, uh, but this, this presentation will be mainly about our big cities. Uh, second, I want to discuss about how transit projects, we, we, you will see that uh, we've been invested, we've been investing a lot of resources on transit in the last 30 years, how these uh, transit projects have shaped the, the cities and how they have influenced urban growth. The main topic of, of my discussion of, of this conversation is about equity, is about how land use, mobility, and equity relate between themselves. Uh, and especially, specifically, uh, I've been working a lot on the accessibility concept. So I would like to show you how we've been using accessibility as a tool to assess different projects in Latin America. I wish to talk about also a little about road safety. And at the end, if we still have some time, I would like to you to show you to show you about how Bogota is doing on cycling, because we are proud to say that we would like to be the capital of the world in terms of cycling. So definitely uh, our cities or mega cities in Latin America have become stronger uh, through time. Different aspects have contributed to that. First, we've been having an important social migration. So probably in the 50s, 60s, or Latin American countries were rural mainly, but in the last 15 years, uh, Latin America is a continent of cities, of big cities. Those cities have found the, the, an opportunity to grow because of this uh, competitiveness, because of these uh, economies of agglomeration, this efficiency, uh, and the, the great power that a big city has in terms of, of being uh, productive and create a welfare. And that's uh, what has happened in, in almost every country in, America, in Latin America. But the other aspect that is usually uh, accompanying this uh, growth is sprawl. So I wanted to show some, some data on that. So you can see here uh, five, six capital cities in Latin America. And you can see the first figure is the population in 2000, the second one in, in 2018. So in Bogota, in 20 years, so we had almost uh, 2 million more people living in Bogota. That's a 25% growth. Buenos Aires is or now almost 40, 14 million um, in 2018. So it was being almost 15 now. Uh, it, it's growth is about 19%, Lima too, 24%. Mexico City has had a huge increase on population, Santiago and Sao Paulo. And one of the things that strike a lot about this population growth is the sprawl. So if you exclude Bogota, uh, the other cities 
have been uh, uh, reducing their density. You can see the density in Bogota is huge. If you look at the numbers globally, Bogota is probably the first uh, densest city in the Western world. So if we exclude some Asian cities, um, some Indian cities, probably Bogota would be the first densest city in the world. And this density is not uh, about uh, skyscrapers or, or about uh, uh, high, high buildings. It's, it's more about really, uh, unfortunately, not having enough public spaces. So if, if we looked at the indicator on public space in Bogota, it would be uh, very low compared to international standards. But the, the, the message here of this um, first, um, picture, first table is really um, this, this growth, this huge growth, of course, it hasn't been very well planned. We, we have here two strong uh, forces that are uh, struggling to, to generate this growth. The first one is the market, the real estate market, the informal, the illegal, and the legal uh, real estate market. And the other one are regulations from um, the authorities. This growth brings, and these characteristics of the cities bring uh, the competitivity issue that we could measure about the, the labor market size, the size of the, of the labor market. Uh, as Bogota is so dense, as you can see in this table, the labor market, even if Bogota has huge problems of, of mobility, you, we, you can see there a very low average trip speed, one of the lowest in the world. Bogota, because of its density, has a huge uh, labor market. Mexico, Mexico, even though it's a bigger city in the table, has a small uh, labor market, mainly because of its low density. So you can see here the, the figures of these four cities. And definitely our, our economies, the economies of Colombia, Argentina, Peru, Mexico, depend in a big part of what happened with those capital cities. In the case of Colombia, Bogota is almost 22% of the GDP um, of the country. The other specificity of Latin American cities is congestion. If you look at the different um, rankings that the technology companies are using, companies like TomTom Tom or Waze, uh, the ranking they do, they, they, they do every year uh, for every city. Well, Bogota is number three of the most congested city, Lima is number seven. And in general, the Latin American cities have this uh, huge uh, problem of congestion. And it is striking because our, Motorization rate still low, it is in general less or just 20 car for 100 uh, inhabitants in the cities. And uh, most of the people still moving in public transport. But despite that, we have a huge congestion. One of the aspects that is also critical in Latin American cities mobility is 
the inequity that uh, starts to show when you look at how the rich move, what are the, the travel times, what are the expenditure that uh, low income and high income population spend. So for example, in Bogota, uh, a, poor, a, a poor household may take almost 100 minutes to travel to work. Uh, and a rich one will take 35%, uh, excuse me, 83 minutes, so a lot less. And uh, a low income a low income household will spend almost 35% of its monthly income uh, in paying uh, transportation. You can see very big differences between uh, every city. So you can see numbers in Buenos Aires are much better, just almost one hour per trip for low income, um, 45, 48 minutes for, for high income population. This is information that we have obtained from the OD service for each city. So, so some of the OD service are, are a little older than, than, than others, but that gives you an idea on how different the, the way we move between uh, social classes uh, is in Latin America. So the other aspect that is uh, specific to Latin American cities is um, that we move in, in public transport. Here you can see the, the model split for five cities in Latin America. The, the red color is public transport. And we have that in kind tiles. So one is the poorest, five is the richest. And even uh, rich population in, in the cities, for example, Bogota uh, is around 20% of people moving in, in public transport, in transit. Um, Quito is all, almost similar. Uh, in Ciudad Mexico, we also have a good uh, use of, of transit mode, on, on, of public transport modes in, in this model split. So we could say that our cities move in a sustainable way. If we go a little bit in detail in, in what happens in Bogota, this is uh, what was the, the OD survey that we produced in 2019. You can see that pedestrians and public transport um, and bicycle are almost 70% of the trips. 30% public transport, 30% uh, non-motorized modes. And we really, we've really been investing a lot on transit. But even though we've been in implementing metro lines, we have interesting big networks of Metro in Mexico City, in Sao Paulo, in Rio, Santiago, Buenos Aires. And we've been investing uh, in, in cities that are, are starting to have Metro line and, and mass transit systems like Bogota. Bogota has a like a 150 kilometer network of BRT. It's starting to build his first Metro line. Quito is already operating the first metro line. Lima is building a third metro line, etc. Panama uh, is building his second metro line. Santo Domingo has already two metro lines. So uh, it is a, a huge investment that has been made by those countries, by those cities. But even we have that, so we have here some images of what happens in Santiago. Santiago is very dependent 
on his very good um, metro network. We have uh, a picture here from Santo Domingo that has already two lines, uh, Rio and Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo has an automated uh, driverless uh, metro already and a very good network. We also have these BRTs, Bogota, Lima, Quito, uh, Mexico City have very interesting uh, BRT systems, Buenos Aires. So it is, it is interesting. So cities like uh, Buenos Aires and uh, Mexico City, they developed first their metro systems and then they are starting to reinforce the network with these BRT systems. In the case of Bogota, Lima, it is the contrary. Those cities started uh, with the BRT and now they are working uh, on the very complex uh, construction on, of metro lines. And we are also having this kind of uh, projects in Latin America. We could say that the, the first uh, cable car used as a means of, of transportation of urban transport uh, was um, the Metro Cable in Medellin. It was uh, on 2003. And after this first experience, uh, cable cars had been all over the continent, uh, almost 15 cities in Latin America have had this um, technology used to feed um, metros, especially in the case of Bogota, the, the picture in the left is um, Transmicable. It is a feeder of, of Transmilenio, of, of the BRT system, and it has brought, um, in general, good, um, good results in, in terms of, of mobility, of course, but in terms of uh, creating new ways of uh, developing the, the city under the, the cable cars. The city, the, the picture on the right is um, Santo Domingo again. Santo Domingo has uh, one line of cable car and it's uh, building a second one uh, at the moment. Uh, but one of the striking things about uh, mobility in Latin America is even though we have this huge investment and uh, a lot of institutions, uh, a lot of international institutions, financing institutions, promoting these big um, mass transit projects, a lot of people still moving in these informal, illegal, last mile systems. So you can see here the conchos in, in Santo Domingo again. I was trying to see the figures of uh, mobility in Santo Domingo. Uh, most of the people in, in the city moving conchos. Even they have already 44 kilometers of uh, metro lines. Uh, the biggest number of trips is made in conchos in Santo Domingo. Well, we have these feeders. This is Lima. Or those ones, uh, busy taxis in Bogota. So definitely uh, the, the approach on, of, on improving mobility, on improving transit systems in Latin America uh, is a huge challenge because we are facing the need to have more efficient ways to move like um, mass transit, like metros, BRT, but at the same time, it is difficult to have a good coverage 
of the territory, especially in cities uh, that are growing, that uh, have a big sprawl, like Lima, for example. So uh, trying to modernize and trying to legalize transportation is one of the big uh, challenges we are, we are having uh, in the moment. One, I, I will show you that later. Um, so inequality is a, a big issue in Latin American cities. And part of this inequality is brought by land use, like residential location, and by transportation patterns. You can see here an analysis on um, access to employment in uh, four cities. It is an, an access to education. So you, you can see here the, the four cities and it is the number of opportunities of work you may have uh, compared with the potential of, of, of the city. So uh, in Bogota, uh, the opportunities that uh, a person can reach is 0 0.4 uh, employment. Uh, in Buenos Aires, it's the highest of the four cities that we have analyzed is almost 0 0.5. And Lima and Me Mexico City have similar number, Mexico being the lowest. And you can see that for the high income uh, access, uh, the, the, the per capita index is better uh, in each of the cities. That means that probably how uh, employment is di distributed in the territory and um, the transportation system allows to get to those places uh, make, makes difference between uh, the, the inhabitants of our Latin American cities. You can see that uh, in the education, um, if we talk about education access, the numbers are better. That means that probably schools, universities, education centers are more decentralized, uh, are more easy to access, uh, are less, have a, a lesser impedance to get to. And that's uh, how we can see um, inequity. So even sometimes uh, we have low income population close to the, to the transport systems. Here in this picture, you can see the, the Metro in Santo Domingo and you can see a poor neighborhood. The other big challenge that we will face is about affordability. So how uh, people can really get to those, to those uh, transportation facilities. So probably in this case, those neighborhoods will have to take two or three vehicles before getting to the, um, to the main system. And every time they will have to pay that will definitely uh, have an impact on the possibility they have, they have to, to travel. This is a picture of Lima again. So you can see the difficulties on access that we meet in our cities. And this is Bogota. So, that gives us like a general overview on our cities and mobility and access in our cities. So big growth, inequities, big investment uh, 
in, in transit, big congestion. And uh, we want to see how this situation uh, interacts between land use, between urban development and uh, transit. So we have some aspects of the theory, induced car demand, of course, what is happening with the, the private car in, in Latin American cities. And we could say that in some cities, there has been a huge investment in road infrastructure. For example, Segundo Piso in Mexico City. Uh, there has been a big investment on, on those infrastructures. And in a short time, uh, those new infrastructures had uh, high congestion too. A better example probably is uh, Santiago de Chile. Santiago developed uh, at the beginning of the 2000, uh, a good network on toll roads in Santiago, very efficient. Tolls are related to congestion. They have different costs depending on, on congestion. And uh, although it has, it has been efficient in terms of not being so congested. In terms of sustainability, definitely uh, the number of trips made by public transport, the, the, the model share in Santiago has changed a lot towards uh, the private vehicle. We also, had, we also have other theories that we've been working on to see what is the case or what happens in, in Latin American cities? For example, uh, the, the, the potential that building a mass transit has on increasing density, the potential that mass transit a metro line has increasing land values, mass transit and, and fragmentation, land use mix, those are uh, middle long-term effects that an infrastructure such as a metro or a BRT could uh, generate. So here are some examples of, of studies we've been working on to see what has been the impact on those of, of those um, projects in the cities. This first example is about uh, trying to see what has been the impact on density in, of Transmillennial system. So Transmillennial first line was developed in um, 2000. Second, second phase was developed in 2006. So in this uh, map, you can see the, the red lines are the Transmillennial um, system, and the green ones are the feeder systems. And you can see how uh, at, in, the, in the left map, you can see how densities have changed. So if you, if you see, for example, in the, in the West, uh, those high areas where, where we had Feed, feeders and Transmillennial, they grew a lot, a lot of, of investment on buildings, high buildings in, in this case, uh, also in the South. So these were low income housing, middle income housing that have created a very, very strong growth in, um, in density. And you can see that in, in some cases, in some areas where we didn't have Transmillennial, the development, development of the growing of, of the population was not so strong.
So that's, that were kind of the results we had in this, in this research. Um, you can see the, the name of, of, the, of the paper on the, on the lower part of the, of the picture. Uh, in 2000, 2001, so we have here a control group and a treatment group. So definitely uh, we had uh, a strong uh, population, strong density uh, in, in the areas where we build the BRTs. So for example, uh, it was in the, the areas um, that were affected by Tramilenio had a population around 64,000 64, inhabitants and the other areas, the control areas, about 38,000 inhabitants. And in terms of density, the areas that were not close to the BRT, we had the density about 12,000. And in the, in the areas where Transmillennial was built, we already had a 17, almost 18,000 uh, inhabitants per square kilometer. And when we, that, so that could be like the, the before project in 2001, and 2008 would be the reality of Bogota after building phase one and phase two of Transmillennium. And we can see here that we have a, an important increase in a very short time, short period of time. We had almost 20% uh, increase on, on density. The other aspect that we are, we've been working on and that I think uh, has brought new light to, to research is the impact of those um, transit corridors on land value. And we've been doing projects, uh, research projects, trying to see what would be the impact for the first metro line. It's about 1 million. But the, the aspects that uh, were new for research uh, were those research, those research that uh, showed that BRT could also generate important changes in land value. And not all those changes were positive. So we had, uh, here we have some examples of, of those um, studies of, of those papers um, related to Transmillennium specifically. So some of them showed that uh, a household close to uh, BRT line had um, a potential of increasing his value uh, depending on the zone. So if it was a poor zone or a middle income zone, or if it was a commercial zone, it would be more, it, ha it would be have a higher probability to, um, to have an increase in land value than if it was, uh, for example, a rich zone, a station or a corridor in a rich zone or in a, in a residential area. And uh, so those studies were able to show through different methods, hedonic prices, um, regression analysis, et cetera. And they, they, they showed that um, BOT had a similar impact that a metro line could have. So in terms of what the potential of a metro line or a mass transit corridor would bring to, to this um, plus value, it is 
interesting to see, and that, that was uh, something we've been working in, in Bogota. So as I told you before, Bogota has created um, his Metro company in 2016, and the Metro line was started to be built like last year, probably, uh, especially uh, what they are doing now is uh, moving the, the electrical networks, the, the communication networks, etc. cetera. Uh, and one of the ideas that we had in Bogota was, was trying to, to really uh, being able to produce land uh, value capture. And the company, the Metro company in Bogota uh, was created with a strong um, part of specialists in, in land value and, and urban development. As we try to generate regulation close to the, to the, to the project that will bring a new uh, land value that would be used to improve this project. So we have this idea. So this is a, a conceptual uh, graphic by, by Cervero. Uh, we had this idea that the, the mass transit corridor could bring uh, a higher land, land value income. But if we had this TOD strategy, we could increase this land value. And we have been working on uh, changing rules, uh, changing regulation, allowing higher um, construction on, on buildings, uh, allowing uh, more attractive uh, zones where we will have um, better sidewalks, we will have uh, parks, green spaces, etc. And this work together between public and private will uh, contribute to have these higher um, costs uh, of, of, of the land. And so uh, we made this study when we were able to calculate the increase in area that could be brought in every station and also uh, the increase in, in, in cost, in the, the potential on, on getting more um, like real estate um, businesses around the stations. One of the aspects that uh, is very critical in Latin American cities, as we mentioned at the beginning, is equity, is how poor people have a, a very hard time uh, accessing the opportunities offered by the cities. And part of this issue, part of, of this prog problem is not only about um, the transportation system, it's not about congestion, it's about how the, the city operates, it's, it's about how the city how, uh, is um, creating his, 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 the users, Etc. And so we've been using a lot the, this accessibility um, concept that in, in, in a way, this concept of accessibility allows us to bring different impacts together. First, housing location relative to work. So we, we will have monocentric cities like Lima, Bogota, uh, that are more complicated in terms of accessibility than 
more decentralized cities like Buenos Aires or, or even um, Mexico City. We will have impacts related to the transport system. We've seen that the public space design, how you can get to those systems. So we can have probably a very good metro line or BRT, but if we don't have a good feeder system, uh, or even if we don't have a good accessibility to the station, good sidewalks, um, et cetera, well, we will limit the, the potential of the, and the investment made in, in the public transport. Uh, a very, very important element in Latin American cities is cost and affordability. When we worked in the, like 10 years ago, we, we, we worked a lot on, on this topic of, of accessibility. The first um, papers we, we read didn't take too much into account affordability. And uh, what we saw in our analysis is that for our cities, for Latin American cities, for developing cities, affordability was probably the key issue that was uh, limiting um, the access uh, to opportunities. And finally, uh, the other aspect that we include in this big uh, concept of accessibility is the individual skills, so what Kaufman from EPFL calls motility. So if we can have this indicator of accessibility, uh, we can really uh, have like a synthetic indicator that is bringing together different impacts uh, that we will have for the, especially for the low income population. So in general, when we looked at the, the projects that were developed, big investment projects, billions of dollars in every uh, Latin American capital, uh, and we tried to see if there was a specific issue, specific indicator related to um, inequity, we, we, we didn't find it. So in general, uh, we had indicators on cost benefit analysis. We had indicators on how these systems could reach poor people. We had indicators on environmental impact, impacts, but we didn't have a specific indicator related to, to equity. And uh, definitely access, accessibility was an interesting indicator in those terms. So we started to analyze different kinds of, of projects, different kinds of situations in, in cities uh, linked to this uh, accessibility. So the other aspect that was striking on, on, on public policies in, in our cities was the one related to social housing. There were big, big projects with a lot of, um, of money into, into them, but the priority was really to give a roof, to, to provide a roof and not necessarily to provide a way to, to improve life in a city. So it was usual that these social housing programs were built in the periphery where uh, land was very cheap, but with a very low uh, quality on, of access and to the opportunities to, to employment, etc. And so <clears throat> we also studied the social housing policies. We, we tried to, to see where they were located. So in general, as I was showing, um, those plans were in the periphery, very far away from 
employment, and this was creating a, a big impact on, on accessibility and in, on costs. So here we, in these projects, um, that was about how um, location, how low-income people located in Bogota related to the access, how important the access was for poor people to make their choice. So the trade-off between location and, and mobility costs. And uh, we analyzed that for low-income population, poor people and very poor people. And the results were really um, kind of, of, of worrying about how costly it was for the population to, to move and what were the, the impact they had to, 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 to bring to support uh, every day. So for the poor people, travel time was really one of the most significant uh, variables uh, when they were de de defining their location but they finally had no, not such a big um, number of, of choices to do. Um, they, in fact, people really didn't care too much about the size or the characteristics of the, of, of, the, of housing, but mainly on, on the location. We also made these um, stated preferences model, trying to see uh, about housing costs, travel time, housing size, how those um, variables could relate when um, a poor household was trying to um, choose his location. So I'm going to, to, to go a little quicker. And so we also measured the impact that those locations would have in terms of environment. So we have here this index that was showing regarding the, the location of the housing, the social housing development, what would be the impact on, on environment? And so we had these uh, peripheral uh, projects that had a, a very important impact on emissions, on particulate matter. Uh, some had good access to employment, some of them had very poor one, and so we, we thought and we concluded that um, housing policies would really need to include this accessibility indicator, this accessibility analysis to uh, generate better solutions for the poor in our cities. Um, so we, we've been working in, in many cities, as I was saying, in Bogota, in many. So here we compared, for example, the accessibility that uh, had was available for low income population or for the high income population related to the location of, of residence and, and work. And we could see how we had so different uh, accessibility uh, indicator for low income and high income population. So for example, this was a community, low income population, very far away from the city center. It had very low accessibility and you could compare it, for example, with high income population well located where almost everyone could get access to a job opportunity. You could also see here what were the very big differences 
in terms of travel time. So the very poor, almost one hour, 63 minutes, 68 minutes, and the, the richest one on half an hour, sometimes half the time uh, spent by your poor uh, household. But probably one of the more uh, critical issues was this one about, uh, as I was mentioned before, the affordability. So we, we found zones where almost 30% of the income was um, used to move to work. We've been, measuring, we've been measuring this accessibility through time. So here we can see the six strata and we can see how this accessibility has been changing. And it is interesting to see how, for example, uh, the accessibility has improved a little uh, for the low income population. So we have three periods of analysis, 2005, 11 and 19, and we have the, the accessibility um, for the six household strata. And so you can see for strata one and two, we have accessibility that is improving a little, but for strata four, five and six, the richest accessibility is going down. And this is mainly generated by the congestion, the big congestion that has increased in, in Bogota in latest years. And we can see the accessibility in one hour time travel. One hour seems uh, an adequate time to spend in, in, a, in, in, in going to work. And you can see the reduction the important reduction we would have if we have this limit of one hour travel in Bogota. We, we use this accessibility concept also to evaluate uh, projects such as um, Metro Cable in, in Medellin. We worked with UCL um, in a very interesting project that was not only concerned about mobility, but other impacts that were brought by the cable car, economic impacts, social impacts, um, et cetera. But in terms of uh, mobility, we also had a very interesting results on what, what, what happened with this, um, with this uh, project, with this facility. Uh, so this was a very popular project. It, it was really a boom. It was the first one. Then, as I mentioned, a lot of, of projects, sim of similar projects were developed in America, in Latin America. Um, so very visible, integrated with the, with the metro in, in the station um, and with an interesting um, development of uh, an overall urban project. So it was not only the station, it was not only the cable car, it was really a development of uh, public space, uh, libraries and, and other facilities for the people. So we use this um, well-known um, accessibility theory, trying to calculate the, the, the number of opportunities that could be um, reachable for every uh, population. It was linked to the cost of these um, opportunities. And in this case, we used a diff diff uh, methodology. So we had a control zone, control population. We had a treatment population, the ones that benefit from the, car, from the cable car. And we measured their their accessibility and we were able to, to prove that this accessibility had increased in, in short time, in five years, uh, because of the cable car. And we could see how the cable car generated 
bigger um, time travel savings and bigger and access to new centralities that were very difficult to access before the project. So finally, I, I wanted to, to show you about um, the, 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 the bicycle in Bogota. So we are saying that we are kind of, um, we would like to be kind of champions of, of the bicycle in Bogota. We've been working in a good cycling network for the last 20 years. The network in Bogota has already 600 kilometers. Uh, in, two, in 2011, we had uh, like um, 600,000 um, trips per day using bicycle. And in 2019, we already had 1.2 million um, trips. We've been working at the university in different uh, research projects, trying to find out what have been the, uh, the, the elements that have permitted to increase in 100% the number of cyclists in, in the city. What we have found is really uh, the network has helped a lot. So for example, Luis Angel Guzman produced a recent paper on how different kind of infrastructure were risky or not, or were perceived to be risky um, for the cyclists. And in the other hand, Alvaro Rodriguez, that is also working in a research group, uh, produced a paper that showed us why, what were the big variables that would have an impact? One of the variables were in a moment, the difficulties we had to have this uh, integrated public transport system, the difficulty we had to uh, have these feeders to, zone, to some areas uh, in the periphery. So we are also very excited on what we've been working on related not only to mass transit impacts, but also to cycling impacts. I think that Bogota is a good laboratory in both of those um, topics. And I think that um, in general, Latin American cities are really making big, huge efforts to have good public transport systems. Some of the cities are trying to have good cycling systems. And now we have this big uh, question on what will happen um, with COVID, what will happen the, with these um, restrictions on mobility that we are having uh, on these um, health um, policies that uh, we had to take and what will be the future. We are having a very uh, difficult time financing uh, transit systems now because um, the number of passengers is almost half after the pandemic than in 2019. So that was in general uh, like the, the kind of, of research and the kind of problem I wanted to show you related to, to Latin American cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bocarejo, for the very interesting uh, presentation. We have a couple of minutes, about 20 minutes for questions and, and comments from people about your uh, presentation. Um, well, I'll probably will take privilege of my position as the moderator to ask you some specific things. 
So the first of all is that when you talk about mass transit in density, and for me, it seems to me that there is an aspect related with the role of the institutional framework of planning in Latin American cities, because when you implement a new line, you can also draw limits in terms of density, or you 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 can um, I would say induce density, higher densities in other parts of the city. And also, if this increase in density is uh, related with gentrification led by new investments in transit. Thank you. you are... want to... Yes, I think this, this is very, very interesting question. So first, some cities have tried to really uh, take advantage on mass transit new projects to try to shape to shape the city in a better way. So the, the big the big example is Curitiba. Curitiba tried to to work on density, so they produced uh, regulation on on real estate to to bring higher density close to the to the corridors and to to promote uh, mixed use, etc. So this is mainly a responsibility from the regulators, from the planning departments of the cities. And some of them have, have taken care of that, but in some cities, this opportunity wasn't really used. So it was really the, the, the market, the, the private sector that some, sometimes they saw the opportunity to to, to have this, to have higher densities. And in terms of uh, gentrification, definitely we, we, we had that, that, uh, that issue, but speci especially close, very close to the main trunk corridor. One of the interesting things we, we found in, in Bogota, for example, was the role of the feeders. If, if you remember when I showed you about how densities evolved in Bogota, some of the areas that had increased the more were not the ones that were close to the main trunk system, but to the feeders. And I think that in the feeders, the accessibility improved a lot, but gentrification really was not so big like it was in, in other parts closer to the big main uh, corridor. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to know if anyone does have a, a question or uh, you can either put on the chat or raise your hand and, 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 and talk uh, about your question. It seems to me that there is a lot of things in this presentation that are interesting and that create the possibility of questions. I have a small question. So every, every like you showed us many things. So every project will have different back, like backlashes because of the project. And even though some people see it positive and some people see it negative. Can you tell us about your experiences of some of the of the backlashes of like good projects that you felt they were really good and you found like big backlash about them? That there were not people were not really for them, although you, you saw that they were going to give a positive impact. I, I didn't I didn't hear you quite well, Hamid. Could could you please repeat? I'll type. I was okay. saying many projects Sorry. will have some backlashes, you know people fighting the projects. So, for example, in the, in the gondola case, when, when, when they, they, they built it, there was a lot of back, some backlashes between some people saying yes and some people saying no. Can you give some of the examples of how you bypass some of the problems that you faced in the backlashes? Because there are, there are always interesting things to say, yeah. but like, give us one example of how you succeeded to bypass some of these. I think in general, 
gondola projects are very well perceived, you know, because it, it's really about a population that has a very low accessibility because they are in, in, in the hills, they are very far away, they have to take a, a illegal transport, they have that is dangerous, that is unreliable. And they will save easily 20 minutes in their trip. So in general, gondola projects are very well perceived. I've been, I've, I've been studying gondola project in, in Bogota, in Medellin. I've seen what happens in Santo Domingo. And these projects in general, they don't have um, big uh, enemies to be developed. It is not the case for BRT. BRT are really more, much more complicated to develop. So first, uh, sometimes it is about taking space from the car. That's the, the big, the big um, thing, that, positive thing about gondolas is you don't take an inch from the car. But in BOT projects, you have sometimes to take parking space, to take uh, car space, and this will bring a difficult uh, discussion. Uh, in, in some cities, um, Lima, Bogota, uh, the opposition was so strong that some of the big projects were stopped and it wasn't, it was, it wasn't possi possible to develop them. So um, in, in, in our countries, we will have big discussion on those projects. But I also think that developing those projects in Latin America is easier than in other contexts because some areas are not so consolidated. We, you can afford to build, to, to buy, sorry, to buy land uh, close to the, to the corridors. And um, that's why you, you can see that there's been a huge growth of, of BRT systems in Latin America. I see Julia is asking us about reliability. For the user, I think reliability is a key issue. The, the Latin American commuter needs to have good frequency. And sometimes buses do not allow that. And one of the interesting things about this reliability in Latin America is that probably people will prefer informal transportation, illegal transportation, like these small conchos or these uh, motorcycles uh, that, that are used to, to transportation because the, the bus system is not reliable. And the, the bus system has not the coverage on the territory that is needed. So one of the big efforts is, is really being able to uh, generate, to bring a good, a reliable system. I, and I think that the metros and the BRTs provide that in general. It is not the case for the bus uh, routes uh, in, in mixed traffic in some of our congested cities. About privacy on gondolas, Hamed. Uh, We have some regulations, at least in, in Colombia, we, we had some regulations. When, when we built the, fir the first uh, cable car in or the gondola in, in Medellin, we had this regulation about the distance of the, of the access to, um, to houses nearby. And I think it was about four or five meters, not, not, not so big. But definitely, you can see uh, what happens in the in, in in the houses, 
uh, when you go in the gondola in, in each city uh, I visited uh, in, in, in Latin American cities. So it's, it is not something that has been uh, solved. The neighbors have to live with that, I, I would say. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I was uh, particularly interested in your findings about uh, affordable housing and kind of people's would much prefer being closer and then something a bit smaller. I, I was hoping to follow up and, and talk a little bit more about uh, buses, which I, I, I think during your talk, you mostly focused on BRT and on the metro systems and then kind of talked about some of the smaller carriers. Um, but in all of the cities you talked about, the, the major modes are minivans, minibuses, conventional buses. And I'm curious about their, their role in kind of the, the future sustainability of uh, large Latin American cities. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Yes, I, I was saying at the beginning when I was describing the, 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 the public transport systems that even though we had these huge investments on mass transit, et cetera, most of the people was moving on informal systems. So I was mentioning, uh, for example, in Mexico, who had the peseros. So even we have this huge network of Metro, this very high quality BRT system in Mexico City, most of the people still move in peseros. And part of, of, of that is, it is very convenient in terms of not having to transfer between modes. So you go, it's almost like a taxi, door to door. Second, uh, its frequency is very good. So it's, it's very reliable and it's very cheap. And so we, we've been having this, this discussion for a long time uh, for example, we, we, we developed a project with the Inter-American Development Bank in Cali and Lima. And the question was, did we lose or did we, we win? Did the user win or lose when we decided to take out traditional means of, of public transport and to put a BRT and the feeders? And I think uh, accessibility is a good way to, uh, to assess that because as accessibility will bring like a, an equilibrated analysis between probably less time, the inconvenience to have a transfer and the cost because the cost of the BRT is generally higher than the cost of, of a traditional public transport um, system. So this is a really, we are in a 2021 and it is very strong. It's a very strong challenge for our cities in Latin America to really be able to have an integrated system when we have buses that come to, to the BOT stations or to the metro station. An example of, of trying to do that is again Bogota. Bogota has bought uh, like 1,500 electric buses that are running in mixed traffic, getting to the neighborhoods. So this is a big, big effort to really improve this feeder system, um, trying to make it clean, trying to make it safer, but um, we still have the competition um, of informal um, transportation. Anyone has um, a question that wants to put forward or a comment? Um, well, while we wait, I can uh, 
put another one, which was something that we had a session previously about Latin global south was not just Latin America cities, but global south cities. And one of the things that came out was, and it was mostly about behavior. And one of the things that came out was a little bit the issue that it seems that a lot of the main differences are between global south and global north cities are related with the institutional framework, which is much stronger in global north cities, the rates of urbanization, which are must fa much faster in the south, and the issues of inequalities, which are much bigger in the global south. But what pass from that discussion is that if you control for those aspects at a certain point from a behavioral point of view we see a lot of similarities so i want to ask you what you think about this uh, proposal if you think it's more or less accurate what do you mean about behavior i mean about what makes people choose some things, what uh, makes them choose one mode of transportation or a residential location or a job location or make a certain amount of trips? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that it, it, is so, it is so homogeneous. I think it is very heterogeneous how you finally decide to, to locate uh in I, I think it depends a lot on how the city uh works i was mentioning about the monocentric cities and the polycentric cities and so how important it was for for a city like bogota or lima to being close to transit because it would change your life it, it would uh save you a lot of time and you you were really uh, you would decide to live in a very small house with not 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 good quality house but if the house was close to to employment because you had a good connection that would change um, your decision but this probably won't happen in 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 Buenos Aires, where you could find a job closer mm -hmm. uh, and convenient, uh, so I think it's very different, and I'm very optimistic on how um, the society, the, the the cultural society, the not only the, the the public, but the private, may change the way they. They think you. What I try to say is, cities like San, Santo Santo Domingo, um, or Lima, or even Buenos Aires, uh, they are very used to ride their car, and they see using a car or using a bicycle like a status problem. So. You, you, if you go in a bus, you're, you're a poor. And I think that has changed in some cities, maybe in Bogota, for example. Different kinds of people are using a lot the bicycle. And uh, maybe in different kinds of, of people use uh, public transport. In Bogota, a lot of people use BRT, even rich people, because congestion is so, so critical. So it, I don't see it, it can be so homogeneous. It, it really changes behavior, mm -hmm. the way you decide things. It's very heterogeneous. Okay, thank you. I have here one last question posed by Shan Lucchesi, which is about the role of safety or security perceptions in use of transit and how can planners in this case contribute to the increase of um, safety 
uh, within this context and the perception of security so to put more people into transit it is a huge concern a big issue in latin american uh, transit systems and especially it is a very big problem of on gender women feel very insecure uh, in those systems Bogota is very critical. I remember Rio too. And so the, we need to make a huge effort to provide a better security perception. One of the things we, we did in Bogota, so we had to change almost all the bus fleet of the Transmillennial system because it had already uh, 15 years old. It was a big investment, and in, in that investment, we uh, it was necessary to put like 15 cameras inside the bus. So each new bus has like 15 cameras that allow to help a little to provide this better sense of, of security, having police in the stations, but it's it's a very tough. Uh, aspect we have to to face, and again, it it is mainly a problem for women. Women' perception of security is far worse than men. Thank you. We have here one final question, which is about. The challenges, opportunities of privately owned bus systems to against uh, publicly publicly owned uh, systems into reaching accessibility goals in terms of like public uh, services might uh, be more equal in some ways because these are public service obligations, whereas private uh, companies will, their main objective is to be reaching a profit level. So how can you? I, I really don't think it's, it is about the profit level or if it is about private or public operation. It is about how the operation is paid. So in Bogota, Bus operation is paid to a private company by the number of kilometers this bus uh, goes through. So the, the income of the private company doesn't depend of the ridership, of the number of, of passengers. And the city has um, Part of, of, of the income that will be used to, to finance uh, public transport comes from these users and part will come from a subsidy from the city. So the quality is somehow um, guaranteed because it's the, the operator, the, like the regulator, that will tell the private how he has to, uh, to operate, the number of kilometers that he has to drive. And it is already settled how it, he is going to be paid. Uh, what happens in general with public companies is that uh, they are not so efficient. We have an example, I, I've been working in Santo Domingo and uh, the, the bus service is not very reliable. They have problems with the maintenance. It is costly. And finally there, it is cheaper to go in this public bus than in this uh, bad quality conchos. But as they are not afford, uh, as they are not reliable, the public buses are not so used. So uh, really my, my experience in, in Latin America is that a very 
very good regulated private system, maybe better in almost every indicator than a public uh, operation. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for your time and this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think I'm not the only one to be very pleased by it. And uh, well, uh, I will try to we, we we could try to have some kind of a clapping between all of us to thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. And well, apparently because this is sunset here, so I'm dark now because I I cannot go up and turn off the light. But uh, so thank you once again and um, join me. Uh, in uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Yao. You've been very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly.